Bonjour, je m'appelle Nicolas, je suis le fondateur et, et aussi le président d'une compagnie qui s'appelle Blockchain. Alors, je vais continuer en anglais et je suis désolé pour les interprètes, ma mère est interprète, je sais que c'est un sujet très difficile, mais je vais essayer de parler un peu lentement. Alors, um, my company's name is called Blockchain, which frequently gets confused with the thing that everybody is really excited about. And uh, my company's mission is to build an open, fair, and accessible financial future, one piece of software at a time. Now, we are a leading financial services and data and analytics company. Uh, we kind of focus on three core services today. So we build wallets, which is software for people to send, receive, and secure digital assets. And they can make transactions with anybody else that also has a wallet. So just yesterday, we passed the 9 million mark on those. We're adding about 100,000 new users a week. Makes us one of the fastest growing technology companies in the world. We also run blockchain.info, which is a website for nerds, data and analytic geeks, and people that like to study lots of information. So you can actually visit that and see how many transactions are happening on the blockchain every single day. And lastly, for the software programmers and developers out there, we run an API that allows you to build all kinds of exciting things. Now, I get to travel a lot for my work, and uh, I was last week in China as well, Tokyo, previously in Palo Alto, London, and New York, and everyone is talking about this thing, and very few people still really kind of understand it. So I'm going to try and explain it in a bit of a different way. Um, I think it's helpful for all of us to take just a little trip down memory lane. Um, Ten years ago, the iPhone had not been invented yet, and people used to have to take photos and develop their pictures in analog, and now that word is extinct. You can take a picture with your phone and broadcast it to your social network, and all of your friends can keep up with where you are. We used to have to go to Blockbuster to rent video cassettes and consume content, and now on nearly any device, we can stream and read books and get music um, instantly, basically, for free, and we know that Blockbuster is no longer with us. The same is true of the Postal Service. Um, and I think this is an interesting one because most of the people in the room now rely on email every single day to send messages to and from each other and to their loved ones instantly, basically for free. And many people don't really understand how email works, but they've come to rely on it as a way to keep in touch with their loved ones. So the point is that the digital world is part of our DNA now. It's part of how we share our experiences, how we consume our entertainment, and how we stay in touch with our friends and family. So why can't our money and why can't financial services be digital too? So my thesis is it's best not to have your head stuck in the sand on this topic. So let's continue on. This was Wall Street in 1957 in all of its glory. And this is Wall Street today in full color. It's a $13 trillion industry that fundamentally has not benefited from the advances that a lot of the things that we take for granted now are able to provide. So let's talk a little bit about the blockchain. What is it? Fundamentally misunderstood and a very, very exciting technology. It's a transaction network. We use these every single day of our lives, whether it's PayPal or MasterCard or other systems. These transaction networks have three properties that make them useful. They have a currency, they have settlement with a high degree of certainty, and they have a ledger, a ledger that keeps track of who owns what. This is very important. Now, through the past 3,000 years, we've used centralized systems, banks or custodians that keep track of everything. And it should be pretty simple to make a payment, right? But if you really think about it, it's not. It's really complicated. That's why, whether you're using PayPal or Venmo or any of the banks that all of us rely on, it's just kind of crazy that in 2016, it's faster for me to FedEx this podium from here to New York than it is for me to make a payment there. So what if there was a better way? Well, distributed ledgers and blockchains provide a really compelling alternative system. And so essentially, we can de-risk the existing system and the legacy system by allowing entities to all keep track of their own copy of that ledger. So let's take a look at this. What is the blockchain? The blockchain is basically a spreadsheet in the cloud. But instead of there being one copy of it, there are copies of it all over the world. And the really important aspect, if there's one thing to take away out of this, is that these databases stay in a constant state of agreement or consensus. 
So when a transaction happens, all the network listens, and every 10 minutes it updates that transaction and that record keeping system. So for those of you that haven't seen this happen yet, sometime today, go to the App Store on your phone, download a blockchain wallet, and find me around the conference, and I will send you your first transaction. You will instantly receive funds, it'll be nearly free, and you'll experience what it's like to build a bank on your phone with 10,000 lines of computer code that's completely free. Now let that settle in for just a second. I'll be able to make a transaction with you, and where you come from, what your gender is, what your credit score looks like, none of that will matter. As easily as setting up a bank account, you'll be able to create a wallet. Now, what are we talking about in terms of the total impact this could have? Well, there are billions of people outside of the financial system today. There are four billion people without credit cards. Goldman Sachs, that has an awful lot at stake at navigating the digital future, did a huge report on millennials. Millennials don't expect to have a bank account within five years. So if we combine the millennials, we combine all the people that don't have access to financial services today, and all the people that don't have credit cards, how are these people going to bank, and how are they going to perform economic transactions in the future? What if they didn't have to wait in line at a bank or go out of their way to get signed up for a service? What if they could just download an app and instantly start to participate in the global economy? Well, that's what they can do right now. So when a transaction happens, it gets broadcast to the blockchain, that big spreadsheet in the cloud. This is a live feed from the blockchain right now. And if you look, you'll see transactions happening for two pounds, one dollar, a hundred thousand dollars. And they're happening all day long, 24-7, 365. In fact, this network has been operating for seven years without interruption. That's a feat no back-end banking system can claim. So what is next? What we really have with the blockchain is not just a transaction network. This is sort of like the first application of it. What we have is a global property rights system. And this is really exciting. So we can do more than just track payments and me sending a transaction from here to New York or Tokyo. We can actually track assets on the blockchain, things that are precious to us, maybe like diamonds or like uh, really fancy paintings. Authentically being able to then transact with those with other people instantly with no intermediaries. Supply chains are really interesting. It's really hard for us to keep track of where things come from. Today, we may go to the supermarket and buy tuna, but we may not really be sure that that tuna was ethically sourced and that it's in compliance with all of the yield and the rest of the things that people are supposed to be doing when they bring goods to market. There are a lot of companies using the blockchain to timestamp goods as they move to market to prove that they came through the places they were supposed to be at the right temperatures and in the right volumes. Payments are a really obvious one, uh, but we need a global, open, and affordable transaction network for the age of the internet. And this is going to become more and more important as more and more devices come online. All of the existing payment networks are totally unsuited for this. If I try and go buy a coffee later today at a uh, brasserie, I'm going to have to maybe pay with a card, but they won't let me unless I spend at least five euros. That's because the existing system is so inefficient and so expensive to use, I can't even pay with my own money without giving them extra. That's silly, and there are better ways. Store of value is a particularly interesting one. In the last year alone, we've seen a variety of countries in frontier and emerging markets where the centralized financial systems have failed. We've seen countries where devaluations have been severe, high rates of inflation, corruption are terrible. So these are places where people could uh, hedge in digital assets to protect some of their wealth. So places that come to mind are like Argentina or Venezuela or Crete or Ukraine and many other places. So we've seen some growth in some of those markets and I think that'll continue. One of the most exciting concepts is the idea of a smart contract and there are many ways that these will come to fruition over the coming decade. But let me provide one potential use case. Imagine a world maybe just five years from now where I'm late to get to the airport after this talk, and so I'm going to have to call an Uber, and that self-driving car is going to show up down the street. Well, I'm going to pay that Uber a surcharge today to get me to the airport more quickly, and along the way, it's going to negotiate with all of the other cars on the road and pay them small fees to get out of the way. So those cars are actually going to earn income while I'm getting to the airport faster. In order for this to happen, you have to have a payment network that's using the internet that's extremely affordable and very, very fast. A payment network like the blockchain. 
So what? So why is everybody talking about this? Yes, it's complicated. Yes, there's a lot of intense cryptography and very complicated computer science behind it. But really importantly, it's the first immutable record keeping system. It's an open network that anyone can write to and no one can unwind. It's a scarce digital commodity. It's a borderless and frictionless payment network for all. And it's the only payments platform that has zero counterparty risk. So what does that mean? It means I can make a payment to someone and it happens instantly. There's no bank, there's no Forex market, there's no clearing house, there's no one in between me and the recipient. They get 100% of the value of the transaction. So um, in conclusion, there's a famous TV show in the United States called Good Morning America. And in 1994, there's a guy that's there and he asks the question, what is internet anyway? And I think it's really important for all of us to maybe take a step back and just admire some of the progress that's been made, look forward to the future that we can build, and maybe ask ourselves right now, what is our blockchain strategy? So if anything I've told you today was interesting, please come find me after, I'd be happy to talk with you. And if anyone is looking for some work, uh, we have a lot of open positions at blockchain, so you can visit us at blockchain.com forward slash careers, and we'd love to have you come join us. So thank you very much. <laughs>